Thanks for having me, everyone. I'm going to share my screen um, so that you can check out my beautiful slides. <laughs> All right. And um, if you do have any questions throughout, please feel free to um, pop them in the chat and um, our lovely host will be monitoring those uh, for, for the remainder until we can have a little chat at the end. Um, so yeah, thanks for the great introduction. Uh, my name is Sasha Francis. Some of you might already have met me in real life <laughs> pre-COVID times, um, and I look forward to meeting uh, many more of you in the future. Um, so I do um, a lot of different programs, which I'll talk about a little bit here, um, but primarily my focus is the um, Galveston Bay Report Card. So if you aren't familiar with uh, the Galveston Bay Foundation, which I think most of you are, um, our mission is to preserve and enhance Galveston Bay as a healthy and productive place for generations to come. Um, and our vision is here as well. And so the bottom line here is that, yes, we protect the bay and re restore the bay, but we also um, want to work with the community to ensure that they are connected to it. Um, and and we do understand that it's a really important resource to the people of this area as well. We have five main program areas, and those are education, um, restoration, water protection and monitoring, conservation and advocacy. So some I know many of you uh, participate in one of these program areas. So thank you for all of you that have or are current volunteers. Um, so, like Michael mentioned, uh, I joined Galveston Bay Foundation in November of 2019 after volunteering um, with different events and programs for about three years. You may know my predecessor, Tanoya, up here in that top right. That was when I was a volunteer for Bay Day a while back. Um, but um, like he mentioned, I was a zookeeper first. Um, so I did that for about 12 years. I worked at Moody Gardens, um, mostly about five years here at the aquarium where I met my fiance. And um, like uh, Chuck mentioned, I will be getting, I'll be plan I'm planning at another event right now, but it's not for work. It's my wedding next week. So very excited about that. Um, but yes, we met working with the penguins and seals and sea lions at Moody Gardens. Um, so from there, I really developed a passion of connecting people to nature and wildlife in a way that mattered to them. So um, that's how I really find people are empowered to wanna to protect their natural environment is by finding a way that, that matters to them in a way they're connected to it. It might not be the same as you and I, and that's okay. Maybe they just really like fishing and they don't really care too much about conservation, but they really wanna be able to fish for the rest of their lives and teach their kids. So whatever it is that, that you know, draws them to wanting to protect something, that's what we're going to um, work with and appreciate and respect. So um, here you can see me on the bottom right. Um, I've always been super passionate about sustainability, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But on the bottom right here, I was tra training one of the macaws at the aquarium uh, Wednesday, how to choose a reusable water bottle over a plastic water bottle. Um, so I would train behaviors like this and work with the animals in a way to convey important messages about uh, sustainability and habitat protection to our guests. Um, so some of the programs that I work with are obviously the Galveston Bay Report Card, our Rain Barrel Program, which some of you have at home, our Marine Debris Monitoring Program, if you're familiar with Nick Ellis, um, he's on travel leave right now, so I'm doing that program with him, and I know we have a few of our Marine Debris Monitors on here, I saw Alice and Wayne were joining us. Um, you'll see a little spotlight of them later. <laughs> and our microplastics project, which I just ran our first microplastics sample um, today from our shoreline to see what kind of microplastics we have in the sand there. Our Galveston Bay Action Network, pollution reporting app, um, plus sustainability and pollution reduction outreach, uh, pretty much anything in the community. That's me. <laughs> so um, the Galveston Bay ecosystem is what we're all focused on at Galveston Bay Foundation. Um, that watershed, for those of you that might not be familiar with it, covers 24,000 miles. Um, which actually encompasses half of Texas's entire population. Um, the bay is resilient, shallow, it's well mixed. Um, on average, only about seven feet deep. Um, obviously, the ship channel is a bit deeper, but um, it's a very shallow uh, estuary. And it's the second highest producer of seafood among estuaries in the United States, which means it's an incredible resource in so many different ways. And the ecosystem includes the rivers and bayous, prairies, like you'll see this blazing star. I know you, you guys can identify that one. <laughs> I planted some this year that just exploded. They're beautiful. Um, freshwater marshes, um, like Exploration Green, saltwater marshes, like at our Sweetwater Prairie and oyster reefs, diverse species of animals, um, as well as us. So how are we connected to the Bay? This is something that I frequently talk about when I start presentations with, with groups that you know may not understand or have a natural connection to the environment 
Um, but it's really important, I think, to note that even folks up in downtown Houston, even downtown Dallas, are connected to the bay because of how big the watershed is. So all of our storm drains drain out into the bodies of water that connect to the bay. So every single thing we do in our backyards um, or in that watershed is going to end up in the bay. So whatever kind of fertilizer we're using or pesticides or how we're watering our grass, what kind of plants we have, you know, the trash, the litter, everything is going to drain to the bay. So here is a, a visual of the watershed as a whole. You can see it starts way up here above Dallas, does encompass Dallas and Fort Worth, and even farther north from that, all the way down through the San Jacinto and Trinity Rivers through Houston, and then down into the bay, way down here. So every single thing that happens along that watershed, you know, whether it's pet waste, chemical spills, oil spills, trash, litter, fertilizers, pesticides, agriculture, it's all going to drain down to that same spot right into the bay, which then leads out into the Gulf. So um, if you guys want to pop into the chat, um, why do you care about the local environment? I know, you know, being master naturalists, um, you all have a lot of amazing connections to the environment, but what's your why? What keeps you involved in this program? What keeps you interested in topics like this? What keeps you connected to the local environment? You know, what's your why? Do you have, you know, kids that you love to take fishing? Um, do you really love doing nature photography? Are you an avid kayaker? You know, did you grow up here and it's just a part of your whole, you know, being and livelihood? If you want to pop in the chat what your why is, uh, maybe you really love cooking shrimp. Um, <laughs> please pop in the chat and um, and share what you, you know, what you, what your why is here. Yes, prairie restoration. Excellent, excellent. I love prairie plants. I've learned more and more about them this last two years, and I just can't wait to plant more in my garden. Oyster catchers, beautiful photography. Of course, Jean said photography. Excellent photographer. <laughs> Kayaking, sea turtles, dolphins. Awesome answers here. I love that. Beautiful. So, oh, there we go. My why is wildlife. Um, as uh, as you know by now, I was a zookeeper. So here is me with one of the birds of prey that I was able to work with, Bucky. Um, and he's Eurasian eagle owl, but very similar to the great horned owls that you may have seen in this in this area. Um, and there at the downtown aquarium, we actually. Had quite a few really large old growth, growth trees incorporated into the property. So we did see a lot of birds of prey out and about, which is really great to be able to tell guests, hey, you know, it's important to be able to provide environments, um, habitats, trees, bushes, you know, spaces for these animals to thrive. So it's really important that even as we develop cities to make sure that we have enough green space to keep animals like this um, going. But my why has always been wildlife. I worked with beluga whales here um, at Mystic Aquarium. And actually, this young lady on the right, uh, she works at the Houston Zoo with the seals and sea lions still. So if you happen to go up there, that's my good friend, Amanda, one of my bridesmaids. Um, but she was my intern way back in the day. But yes, why my why is definitely wildlife. I just have a huge passion for animals. So um, when we think about what our why is, um, then I start to think about what are the threats to our why. So, you know, for example, if your why is wildlife um, and just, you know, the natural parts of the bay, um, habitat loss and destruction is a, is a huge threat to the bay as a whole. Um, invasive species out competing native species, climate change, not only a threat to wildlife um, and the bay as a whole, but also the community um, and the excess nuisance flooding that we have because of climate change and more storms. Freshwater inflow imbalances um, can really affect dolphin health. If there's too much freshwater in the bay, like after Harvey, they can develop skin lesions. Overfishing, impacting the balance of the species and the biodiversity in the bay. Um, pollution, obviously, making a huge impact on, on animals and people around the bay. So the Galveston Report Card is this really amazing program that addresses all of these threats and all of these different whys and interests around the Bay. So um, the Galveston Bay Foundation partnered with the Houston Advanced Research Center, also known as HARC, um, in 2014 and developed some stakeholder surveys. So surveys for all the people around the Bay, whether they work in the industries on the Bay, whether they are, you know, just 
families that maybe visit the bay every now and again or like to go fishing or swimming, all different types of people around the bay. And from the surveys, they basically developed these six different categories and 22 indicators to have a community driven assessment of the bay and the threats to its health. So every year that would come out because one of the things the stakeholders said in their survey was we really want to have more frequent updates about the health of the bay, not just every four years when State of the Bay comes out, which is a bigger, more kind of heavy document more for the scientific community. But it was funded from 2015 to 2020 through the Houston Endowment. Um, they had committed to a five year funding. That funding has ended. So we're still continuously looking for funding. So please, if you love this program, um, please share the, you know, spread the word, let people know. Um, if anybody's looking for a cause to donate to, this is a great one, and I'm about to tell you why. And since then, um, we've had an annual report card every year since 2015 and reached over 20,000 people in person. And even when we weren't in person, when we were doing virtual uh, content during COVID, we still managed to reach about um, our average, about 8,000 people per year um, doing presentations, doing um, online videos and different things like that. So um, our 2021 launch um, for the safety of the community and our staff was on Facebook, was a virtual launch again. Um, I did this last year and basically we created three different videos that talk about what the report card is, what questions it answers in the community, and then also um, what the grades were last year. So this year we did that again with these brand new grades, um, made a brand new video. And so we launched it um, last, what's that last Tuesday? Two Tuesdays ago um, during a virtual lunch hour um, where we did a live introduction and then shared these short videos. You can still find those videos at galvesbaygrade.org, which you'll see that website multiple times, so don't worry. <laughs> so the 2021 Galveston Bay Report Card, um, it's always based on the previous year data so that we have enough time to gather all of the data and process it. He's the researchers at Houston Advanced Research Center do that. So this is 2020 data revealed in the 2021 report card. So um, we're going to talk about some different category and indicator grade changes. You'll see what those are. Um, and the big news is that there were improvements, but for the first time since I've seen ever, no decreases in grades, which is a really is really good news. <laughs> Um, but there were some impacts um, of the pandemic on how much data we were able to gather. Um, and also, we are having kind of a new focus on individual community outreach projects um, and growing our litter and trash data collaborations. So something brand new for the report card is our community day. So uh, in the past, we've always had like a press release for the report card where we invite media and like, you know, different folks out to have this kind of big, you know, podium and this is, these are the grades and really a, a more formal thing for the media, um, which is, it, it's important to get the information out to a widespread audience, but something that I really wanted to do and was important to me was to also make a space for the community to get to know the report card resources and understand um, how they're connected to the health of the Bay and how these grades, you know, can help them um, keep their family and community safe as well. So I wanted to create the Report Card Community Day. So we're doing that for the first time ever this year. And that's gonna be at the end of this month on October 30th in San Leon. So this is in addition to that press conference. Um, because of COVID, we haven't done a press conference. We're just doing kind of virtual media stuff. Um, but this will be something we have every year and it'll be a weekend event with local partners and resources specific to the community where it's held. And that will rotate every year. This particular year, we're choosing San Leon because they're part of another kind of project. Um, about pollution that we have launched. So we have some surveys from that community to know exactly the resources that they need. Um, so we're going to um, kind of get together with some other partners and have this community day. But anyone's welcome to come. It's gonna be outside Topwater Grill. Um, there is an event on Facebook if you wanna check it out. We'll be talking about the report card, but we'll have other sorts of resources, um, activities, giveaways, things like that. So um, getting into the report card as a whole, um, the six categories that we talk about, I'm going to go through these a little bit to give you an understanding of, you know, why, why we have these categories, what the grades were, and also kind of what Galveston Bay Foundation does to address these categories. So the first one is human health risks. This green B here, that means the grade increased from the previous report card the year before. Any green squares mean that grade increased as well. So seafood consumption safety was something that people definitely wanted to learn about. Is it safe to eat the fish in the bay? 
Um, generally, yes, it is. You'll notice the bay has a, a higher grade than the rivers and bayous. And that is because the closer you get to the, the real center of the ship channel, the you know, less we recommend you're eating things like blue, blue crab um, and things like that. The lower you're down into the bay, generally all the seafood is very safe to eat. So that's good news. Recreation safety um, really looks at uh, bacteria numbers in the bay. So some of you may be our water quality monitors who might do those bacteria samples. Um, but these grades increase this year um, because of less bacteria in uh, some of our samples. So that's good news. So um, with each of our categories, we have a what you can do here. And that is the way for the community to look at the grades and look directly next to it and say, okay, well, how can I help with this? Well, you can pick up your pet waste and dispose of it in the trash. Just one simple, little easy thing that they can do have on their mind to try to contribute to that grade. Um, so in each of these categories, I make infographics um, and talk about a little bit about something that people can do to help. Um, and also give, you know, warnings, like if it, there's been a heavy rain, don't go in the water if you have an open wound or you're immunocompromised. Um, the bacteria levels are gonna be up and that can be dangerous. So um, then I'll talk about different things that they can do, like I said, picking up pet waste and maintaining septic and sewage systems. Um, are some contributing factors people can actually control. So the San Leon Community Day will include that Galveston County Health District resources for septic maintenance. This was a topic of concern in those surveys that I mentioned. So we're really trying to cater to the community for what they want to learn about. And in this case of San Leon, that's something that they expressed. Um, and surveys in Kima and Baycliffe indicated pet waste as a concern because um, we did pull a lot of apartment complexes there. Um, and GPS water quality monitoring team includes bacteria testing, so we can keep an eye on trends and issues in this category. So that's how we contribute. Habitat. Um, there was no change here, um, which is good news that it's holding steady. Um, and it seems that the, you know, efforts of saltwater wetlands restoration, like what we do, um, has really helped that that um, environment stay steady and stay resilient. Um, it's still, you know, a long way to go to get it back to what it was a long time ago, but freshwater wetlands does remain a D, um, and that is because that is definitely an environment that not a lot of people think about and doesn't get very much attention um, and definitely falls victim to development inland. Um, so on the coast where there's still water, it's easier to plant saltwater wetlands, but in inside of the coast, in urban areas, in suburban areas, it's harder to then reestablish freshwater wetlands because there's already a lot of concrete and development there. Luckily, a place like Exploration Green, which a lot of you are familiar with, is a great example of creating, recreating, reestablishing freshwater wetlands from a previous, you know, waste of water being a, um, being a golf course. Um, and instead, that actually now serves as flood mitigation as well as a brand new uh, freshwater wetland habitat, which is amazing. Um, so that's an awesome, awesome case study for that. Our oyster reef uh, populations, it's an incomplete for now, but we are getting more and more data to get a letter grade for that in the near future. So you can help by um, participating in our local restoration and conservation efforts. Um, or if you're familiar with Exploration Green, doing some wetland plantings um, or nursery work there as well. So um, in habitat, things that we do, like I mentioned, marsh grass plantings, we still held those throughout the year, um, smaller groups, um, mass, depending on how close people were going to be. We basically had people come with the people that lived in their household and you would pair up with that person because when you are planting grass, you can be a little close to each other, but then we would spread those individual pairs out. Um, and just a shout out to our oyster shell recycling program since we're talking about habitat. They expanded this year and added 11 new restaurants which is amazing. So now we have total 20 partners in the Houston through Galveston area, which is just mind blowing. We got our new oyster dump truck as well, which is really cool. So we did oyster reef restoration and monitoring um, throughout the year. We also paired with Texas A&M um, for some research on uh, our oyster reef here, which you can see out here with Haley at our Sweetwater property. Water quality. Um, so this grade stayed an A across the bay, which is really good news. Um, these nutrients and the balance of these nutrients is really important um, for wildlife as well as the, the plants um, and the water quality as a whole in the bay. So um, something that we recommend for, for keeping excess nutrients out of the bay um, is reducing your runoff. So having a rain barrel is really helpful for that. Um, so our, like I said, maintaining an A is great news. Um, our rain barrel program helps reduce runoff in the area to keep excess nutrients out of the bay, collecting those um, when, when there's heavy rainfall, those nutrients are just run 
out from your yard, from agriculture, out into the storm drains and out into the bay. So um, the more we can kind of uh, reduce the large amounts of runoff during rain events, and we can kind of control the flow by gathering some and letting some out when it's not pouring rain, um, really helps. So in 2020, we distributed 288 affordable rain barrel kits to the community, which equals uh, 302,400 gallons of water every year, which is wild. Um, and I mean, we're doing these numbers every year, if not more. So just think of how much of an impact that has. Um, this is me installing a rain barrel uh, for the garden at Ollie here on Galveston Island. Um, and a virtual rain barrel, rain, rain barrel workshops have been a huge hit, um, allowing people to come through, drive through, pick up their barrel and kit, and then have a Zoom meeting to talk about how to install it. And we made a brand new installation video so people can have that to keep. Um, so that's been really good for people being able to conveniently come out and pick it up during a time window and not have to be in an in-person workshop. And we might continue to do that because it's been a huge success. Um, coastal change. So uh, sea level rise will always be an F because the sea just keeps rising. Um, the sea level rise grade that we utilize does take in consideration subsidence. So that is the sinking of the land and the sea level rise. Putting those numbers together, you're gonna get that relative sea level rise. So that's probably always gonna be a bad grade because yeah, that's gonna keep happening. <laughs> um, but water pH is good, which is good news. Um, freshwater inflow is something that we can help with that grade rising is uh, conserving water at home. Again, through a rain barrel, turning off the tap or brushing your teeth or washing your hands, um, being a little bit more cognizant of how you're using your water and how much you're using, um, as well as reducing energy use as well. So, you know, carpooling if you can, turning off lights when you're not in the room, getting energy efficient appliances and things like that. Um, so the relative sea level rise, um, what I was mentioning is continues to be a concern and always will be a concern. Um, something that we did do this past year to assist with this grade is we launched an improved water my yard tool, which if you haven't heard of watermyyard.org, it's really cool. Um, it gives you personalized watering recommendations based on the sprinkler types or lack thereof that you have and rainfall data as close to your zip code as possible. So it basically will give you a notification, however often you set it to say, hey, you don't have to water your yard today. It rained a bunch. Or, hey, you should water your yard this week for 10 minutes. Um, every three days. It will tell you exactly those recommendations that you need so that you're, you're using less water, you're saving money, and you're helping reduce freshwater usage. So these two programs can help reduce reliance on city water, um, which reduces subsidence because subsidence occurs when you're pulling water from those, those rivers and streams and everything um, that's coming from under the ground basically. Um, and that will reduce the land sinking or subsidence. So um, with coastal change, we, we discuss the impacts of flooding on our local communities um, through blog posts and store preparedness information um, at our website, galbaygrade.org. Houston Advanced Research Center has another tool for this. This is a beautiful photo of my backyard. Yes. And was this a hurricane or a tropical storm? No, it was not. Anybody who lives down here knows, and honestly, parts of Houston now, sometimes it's just a heavy rain one day will just totally flood everything. So that's Broadway right there in Galveston. Um, and yeah, just totally floating my my kayaks around. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's a struggle. Climate change is a struggle, especially for people on the coast, um, like us all the way in Houston and Galveston. We all are affected by this coastal climate change um, issue. So our staff takes part in important advocacy and policy work to protect the community in the Bay as well. We promote green infrastructure solutions like our Kima property being a ton of prairie restoration and tree planting. Um, we have the freshwater little wetland uh, bioswales there. Um, and the more we develop a property being cognizant of that, we have um, permeable pavement uh, as half of our parking lot. Um, in our educational events and materials, our living shoreline programs, encouraging people to plant grass instead of putting in bulkheads. Um, native plants and prairie restoration, we talk about that a lot in our outreach. Um, and we work with Texas Living Waters and Exploration Green, um, who both are, are great examples of trying to get this information out into the community and have them see it um, firsthand. So wildlife grade did not change. Um, but we always like to talk about what people can do to protect wildlife in the area. Um, I'm sure many of you already know and are very aware of protecting wildlife and I'm sure are very helpful in this effort around the Galveston Bay area. Um, so we did have reduced data here um, um, for the wildlife grade, especially birds. 
due to COVID restrictions um, on bird surveys for citizen science volunteering, I know a lot of you being master naturalists um, weren't able to uh, do as much volunteering during COVID because of restrictions. So perfect example, um, citizen science is, is really important. And, you know, we need folks like you to, to get some of these grades. So that was, that was a bit of a struggle, but um, it's still really important to note to bring attention to folks like master naturalists um, and our volunteers. So our habitat restoration and land conservation is obviously crucial, providing shelter, food resources, and cleaner water for wildlife. Here's a photo of when we did um, Squawk Walk, which is coming up on November 6th at Exploration Green. I brought our little telescope out there so folks could look at the bird island. <laughs> um, and yeah, we, we work with Exploration Green a lot. We have the conservation easement on that property to be able to help them out, which is awesome. And it's just a beautiful property if you've never been. Um, but that's a great example, too, of preserving um, shelter, food sources, and, and water spaces for wildlife in an urban area. Um, Galveston Island was certified as bird, a bird city, which is really exciting, in February of this year. The Sweetwater Preserve provides 449 acres of crucial bird nesting and resting habitat, which contributed to our bird study certification. So I worked with um, some other groups on that to, to help us get that certification. So that's awesome. Um, our annual wildlife events um, educate the community on wildlife. So some new ones that we have going on that started last year was Exploration Green Squawk Walk. And I just went to the LGBT Outdoors Fest to host a birding workshop. Um, and that was a little bit farther up the watershed just north of Houston. So that was a cool way to get in that community. Plus, we do the crab trap removal, Houston Bird Week, and other various wildlife outreach opportunities. We do have a new outreach project about diamondback terrapin awareness, specifically educating crabbers on diamondback terrapins getting caught in their um, traps and what to do if that happens. So that's rolling out this winter. Um, so climate change, water quality, and wildlife, um, these are all really connected. Like I mentioned earlier, um, our, our dolphin program, our Galveston, Day, Galveston Bay Dolphin Research Program monitors the local populations of bay dolphins. Um, so salinity and pollution definitely are of concern. They've seen dolphins with, you know, um, cut, cut dorsal fins and things like that from fishing line and plastic pollution, but they're also affected by freshwater levels. So I mentioned the lesions after Hurricane Harvey. This is part of the study um, that they did and went out and monitored. And here's a photo of one of their well-tracked dolphins with lesions from fresh water. So you can see that during Hurricane Harvey, there was a great number of individuals, uh, almost 50% um, that had lesions. Luckily they did recover. You can see here that they did recover afterwards once that balance was restored. Um, so nutrient runoff, toxins, oxygen levels, they affect animals like you know, fish and, and marine mammals, but also coastal plants. You can uh, adopt a dolphin today through our website, galbay.org. Just wanted to plug that real quick if you're looking for a fun gift. Um, and our last category, pollution events and sources. You can see we got a green letter here. So probably by now you figured out that means it got better, which is good. Um, uh, fitting time to talk about the fact that this grade increased. Uh, there were no major oil spills in 2020 in the Bay. In 2019, there was. So this grade was previously an F. Um, so that's great that that has improved. Overall, the number of spills is pretty steadily low these days in our area. Um, and when they are, when there there are spills, it's usually, you know, five gallons or so or less. However, just a day or two ago, unfortunately, there was a leak at Marathon in Texas City. Um, it seems that they have contained that um, and it was not in the water, um, whereas the one in 2019 was actually a vessel in the water. So we're hoping um, that that didn't impact the bay too much. Obviously still getting into the groundwater um, and getting into the grass areas over there is not great. So we still don't know the effects of that, but uh, keep your eyes peeled. Um, so our litter and trash grade is what we're really working on here, trying to get a grade for this. It can be really difficult because we really wanna make sure it's solidly scientific grade. Oh, just as I was saying about Alice and Wayne, two of our awesome marine debris volunteers, shout out to them. Um, so some of the things that we're doing um, to really try to get a grade on this pollution events and sources category is um, working through, um, working with Houston Advanced Research Center 
having our marine debris monitoring program, which is what you see this photo of here. So we have seven monthly sites around the bay. We added three new survey sites and new volunteers this past year. So every, every month we go out, um, our staff personally goes out to two to three sites um, every month. And then we have some volunteer run sites as well. And every month we survey the same 100 meter stretch of beach. Um, we have four random transects um, that we collect all the trash from and then usually Wayne and Alice <laughs> categorize that trash and record it. And then um, our wonderful intern, Megan, puts it into the NOAA database. Um, and then we upload photos and that tracks all of the different types of debris we find, um, whether it's plastic fragments, styrofoam fragments, you know, uh, piece, random pieces of barbecue um, equipment, et cetera. But this contributes to data all along the Gulf of Mexico, which is really cool, um, and even farther than that. So these kinds of projects um, and working with um, other organizations like the Partnership and Letter Prevention, um, PLP, um, these are really great, and Splash, uh, some new organizations. These are really great organizations that we collaborate with in order to make as big of an impact as possible, including things like the Parks Board and Galveston Unsafe Park. Having collaborations along the Bay um, and the Gulf has been really crucial and they're only getting better and we're you know, working hard to keep that going. So we also do a lot with NERDLs. So the community is very interested in NERDL surveys uh, and awareness events, which, which Nick Ellis definitely launched for our organization. So I hosted a NERDLs 101 class at Kima Property talking about NERDLs, which are the little raw plastic pellets that are used to make um, all things made of plastic, and they're all over our shoreline. So teaching people how to recognize them, how to do a NERDL survey, you can check out nerdlepatrol.org for that. Um, and during COVID especially, uh, I did a lot of creative online pollution reduction outreach for Trash Bash and Plastic Free July and was given the name Sustainable Sasha as a result. So that's my new uh, tag tagline, my new name. Um, so, <laughs> oh, here's one of the things we did on our shoreline. We did a, a trash cleanup combined with an artist named Mario who actually did our shirts for Bike Around the Bay this year. Um, he made this beautiful yellow crown night heron and we had um, our folks that came out decorate it with trash they found. So just a fun creative thing we did in addition to the sustainable Sasha stuff, which I'll share a little bit more of later. Um, so some of the things that, um, some of the other things to note in this category that we're contributing to is um, both us and the Houston Beach Research Center contributors to the Galveston Bay Watershed Aquatic Debris Action Plan um, through the Partnership for Litter Prevention. Uh, you can visit donttrashagoodthing.org for that. We participate in a bunch of working groups, um, like I said, coordinating with those other organizations. We assisted with the intentional balloon release ban, which just passed in Galveston this August, and we're working on bringing that up the watershed in Houston. Um, we just started our new microplastics research project today. I just, I built a device for that, uh, and so we're monitoring microplastics on our shoreline. And we've developed more partnerships for cleanup events, um, which some of those are listed here. Here's our partnership with the um, Splash Group through American Bird Conservancy out at Monument Inn. And here's my alter ego, Sustainable Sasha. <laughs> so I've created quite a few videos for our YouTube channel um, and blog posts um, and just social media content to share kind of uh, things I've learned through my own personal journey with trying to be more sustainable and reduce single-use items, uh, plastic and otherwise. Um, so... I, uh, I definitely encourage people to request sustainability presentations uh, for any groups you have. I did one for Lion Del Cell recently, which is a plastics company um, who supports our rain barrel program. So they actually really wanted to hear kind of what I had to say about sustainability and, and things that you can do to reduce uh, single use waste um, and conserving energy and reducing impacts as a whole. That's my front yard. Hmm. That's before I removed my oleander and put in Texas Silver Star Sage, which is far superior. <laughs> um, so so Sustainable Sasha, here's one of my other videos. Um, I share guidance on local recycling rules, um, making it easier for people to understand what they can and can't recycle, um, how to get connected to their recycling facilities near them. Um, the blog post we did for it has a list of all the different recycling facilities, Houston, Galveston area, suggestions and links for sustainable products that I find are that, that work and are affordable or things that you just have at home that maybe you didn't think of. Pollution reduction and mitigation tips, um, including where to recycle fishing line, which I know a lot of you are familiar with, reducing boater waste um, and runoff. Um, I like to remind people that your plastic film can go to the grocery store, the same place you would recycle your single-use grocery bags. 
Um, you can bring all these other plastic film products there as well. I'm that person that goes in with like my like rice cake bag and all those other little things. And I'm like, doo, 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 put it in there. They're probably like, what is that? That's not a grocery bag. <laughs> so um, it definitely takes collaboration and effort across all levels from industry, government, community, businesses, et cetera, to really reduce the pollution, the litter and trash issue. Um, so some of the blog posts I write are cover stories um, on the Galveston Bay Report Card website, galbaygray.org. Um, one of them I wrote was Hol how to holiday without harming the bay, for example. So sustainable gift guides, um, talking about our teamwork with the different organizations I mentioned to really try to tackle um, pollution reduction in the area. So check out the cover stories. They're all written by me in the last few years, um, but kind of current events, whether it's nuisance flooding, sustainability, pollution reduction, the report card as a whole, et cetera. So why is this tool important with all these different categories? You know, is it just letters and just data? It's really important because the community wanted something like this. They wanted more regular updates on Bay Health. So we want to follow through with them. But in addition to that, it functions as a hub of information. Um, stories and resources for Galveston Bay Foundation programs. So it really ties together all of those program areas that I mentioned and all of the work that we do and kind of give it a, a kind of a home base of how it, it contributes to all these different issues that are, the Bay is facing. Um, so report card funding supports it, the data collection through the Houston Advanced Research Center and the ability to provide resources for the community that, that they need and are asking for. Um, or just to make it easier for them to, you know, contribute to Bay Health. So the community-based outreach um, really has proved to create lasting behavior change compared to just showing up and going, you need to do this, but really focusing on what they're interested in um, and what benefits them as well. So using kind of those approaches. So it, it, is a family interested in birds? Great, I'll talk about birds and why, you know, the health of the environment here affects bird health and birds, you know, in the long term and whether species continue to show up here or not. Are there boaters that want to learn about water quality and pollution? Great. I'll talk about that. Homeowners want to want tools to save money and maybe also help the environment. Cool. I can talk about that. Um, businesses want to be more sustainable. Great. The, the report card allows Galveston Bay Foundation to be able to go out and follow these different interests in the community um, through this resource and this hub. Um, some kayakers, you know, we gonna, we're going to follow whatever interests folks have to connect them back to why it's important to care for the environment. So that community um, based outreach this is, you know, a great example of it. We're going out to um, San Leone and Kima in October and November, following the surveys that we put out in those areas, asking people what they were interested in. And not only does it ask them like what litter and trash problems they, do they think are in the area, but also how do they connect with the Bay? How do they connect with the environment period? Do they just like to barbecue outside with their family? That counts. That's being outdoorsy. That's being outside. That's, you know, appreciating the natural spaces. So every little thing, you know, helps and makes people feel that they, they are a part of, of the Bay community, even if they don't go boating or go fishing or have a house on the Bay. They're still part of this community and part of this watershed. So we are collaborating with these communities to address their concerns in their backyards, in their bayous, in the Bay. We have bilingual surveys. So all the surveys we put out were in English and Spanish. And we're going to continue to provide those resources. In fact, the report card website in its entirety is fully available in Spanish. And it's probably one of the only conservation websites that I know of that is fully available in English and in Spanish that is not originally Spanish based. Um, so we have focused outreach events uh, in these areas to connect more people with the report card. So that's coming up October 30th and November 19th. So keep an eye out. Um, so the report card website is full of resources. So you can actually click around, see the grades. You can see all the different categories as well as indicators here. And you can see past report cards too. Um, you can see cover stories. Uh, here's the one I wrote on nuisance flooding because Galveston Bay actually has, uh, has the record for the high, most high tide flood days in the United States. So <laughs> read that cover story, pretty proud of it. Um, it's very interesting. I might answer some questions that you have. There's my street again. Uh, luckily they've done a little bit better uh, storm drain repairs here. So um, it also has uh, infographics in English and in Spanish um, to help people understand what the different habitats are across the Bay. 
and how they can help, as well as um, how they can reduce um, pollution ending up on our shorelines um, and some resources like Galveston Bay Action Network for that. Um, there's also this amazing what you can do tool. So one of the toggles up here is the what you can do tool. You can go across and you can click these different filters, say, okay, well, it's just me. I have an hour. Uh, I am at work and I want to help reduce pollution and help wildlife. And then you hit filter and it'll actually pull up specific suggestions and links for your interests and whether you have kids, whether you're at work or, you know, a business owner, et cetera. And it will show you um, all these different suggestions. And then you can click on these links for even more in-depth resources and solutions. We also have our brand new mission website or mission page, um, which our main mission is pollution prevention, because that is one of the things people can really immediately help with. So um, this also houses our report card videos I mentioned. They are on our YouTube channel as well. But the mission page shows you all those videos as well as connects you to those sustainable Sasha resources, the what you can do tool. Um, and we encourage people to participate on social media with our hashtags. So um, again, I know a lot of you are familiar with Galveston Bay Foundation, but if you're interested in you know, learning more, getting more involved, you can become a member. You can join our event. Our next event coming up that we have is Bike Around the Bay on uh, the 23rd and 24th of October. And um, we also do have, you know, marsh grass planting opportunities, um, marine debris monitoring programs and things like that. And you can report pollution um, with that GBAN app. It's a free app on your um, app store, or you can go to galvebay.org slash GBAN and find the website. If you're interested in volunteering, your person to go to is gonna be Miss Emily Ford. Here's her information and I can put that in the chat as well. Um, if you don't remember her name, but you remember my name, you can look me up on our website and email me. That's fine. Although I will be out of office next Wednesday for a week for my wedding, but you can sign up for alerts through to our, through our website. So um, thanks so much for all of you for being amazing stewards for the local environment. Um, I really appreciate all of you and how much you obviously care being master naturalist. I know that's a very dedicated um, process and especially to keep up with. And I want to give a little shout out again and thank you to our awesome volunteers that we have here, which is Alice, Leonard, and Wayne that come out frequently to help us out. If you have any questions, um, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, our hosts are going to be going through and, and offering opportunities to unmute if you do have questions. So just stay tuned for a moment. Um, check out galvegrade.org our community event, October 30th. Um, and then my email is here, which I will put in the chat as well. Um, so I'm gonna click out of here so that we can see all each other's beautiful faces <laughs> and uh, check out what we have in the chat. Sasha, our first question's from Jean. If Jean, if you could unmute and ask your okay. question. Sure, Sasha, can you hear me? Yes, so sir. You, you mentioned that you've lost your funding from the heart, the funding. So what does it cost on, on an annual basis? How can we help? How do we help this thing keep above, above water? So um, basically the, the report card, we, we received some funding this year um, from the Port of Houston. The Port of Houston funding, um, they gave us about half of what, what we were hoping for. They gave us about $38,000. Um, yeah. Um, but we were hoping for more than that because, like I said, the, the report card funding is really fills in, honestly, any gap at, at the organization. So anytime the community wants to learn or, you know, I get asked all the time, can you come out to this event? Can you come out and teach, this, teach us about this or that? If it's not already covered by a grant, which a lot of our grants that we receive are for planting marsh grass or for bike around the bay or for very specific things. But anytime the community wants us to come out and do a presentation like this, for example, I, if I don't have the funding for it, I have to say, would you like to hear about this instead? Because that's what I have money for to pay my salary. Right. So, um, and to buy supplies like the report card, you know, support the data collection and things like that. So um, really the report card funding is a way for us to follow through on all these community requests, as well as continue to gather this data. So when the report card funding comes in, it supports not only my work out in the community um, and the things that, they, that, that are being requested by the community, but also the Houston Advanced Research Center's actual data collection. Right. So right. it's both you know, science and the community engagement component, right. and that's why it's so important. So what we have right now is you know, probably about 
40% of the money that we do really need to continue to, to, to do this. But um, what was I going to say? Um, but the, the specific thing about the Port of Houston funding is it's great, but it's very specific to the community around Port Houston. Okay. So it's basically within a three mile radius of Port Houston, which is, right. those, are, those are communities that definitely need um, a, attention and outreach. And we're going to be doing specific outreach with surveys and things in that area. But anyone outside of that area, if they want to learn about the report card or they have specific interests about, I want to learn about birds, I want to learn about water quality, blah, blah, blah. Um, I can't bill per se to this grant because they're not in that project area. So it makes it makes our ability to get out of the community very restricted in certain ways, unless it's for a specific community, which is great to have that time and that money to do that. But outside of that, you know, being able to follow through with other communities so, that request it. So it sounds like I have two action items. If I wanted to have my HOA invite you to talk about this, we should make a contribution from the HOA in a significant amount of money for your program specifically. That would help? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So basically, yeah. And anytime. Ask. Yeah. But exactly. we can do that. Anytime, you know, you want to donate to an organization like Alpha Bay Foundation, if there's a project particularly that you're interested in, definitely right. speak up and say, hey, I would like to support the report well, card or I would like to support oyster reef restoration. I would like sure. to support X, Y, or Z. But also we need we to get support our programs funded. But we need to support the ones that are running out of funding. So that's another turnout. The other thing I can do, I'm on a uh, port commission committee. Mm -hmm. I'll just suggest that maybe they need a broader perspective than just their neighborhood. Maybe because I'm supposed to represent Bay users mm -hmm. and the Bay is bigger. And, I'm, and I know they need to take care of their immediate neighbors, but maybe yeah. I can help them understand that other areas need as much support as their immediate neighbors, not to take away from that, but to increase right. their gift. Okay. Yeah. That's and it. I think, you know, the port is, is great in a way that they pick a variety of, of projects to support every year. So, you know, in giving us less money, they were able to support an additional project, which is great. Um, and, you know, definitely needs to be spread around. Um, so it, it, it's a good way to kind of push us to to focus on a specific community this particular year. So I what I would ideally like to see is like each year as receive a grant for one specific or two specific communities that really need more focused attention. And in addition, receive some funding that's broader for us to be able to say yes to anybody that asks and requests and wants to learn more because I I hate saying no. <laughs> I hate saying no. I hate saying like, I don't, you know, I, I don't have the time because I have to focus on this other thing that needs to be spent down. You know, I would love to have, you know, kind of a bowl of each each year to say, okay, okay. this is our main focus area for this particular span of months. But also anytime anybody wants to learn more, I want to be there for them, you know? All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Jean. Okay. Our next question comes from Joe Monday. Joe, if you could unmute and ask your question. Hello? <laughs> Joe, are you there? She's having, she's going in and out, Cindy. Why don't you okay. ask the question? Okay, so Joe had asked, when is the next rain barrel distribution date? Great question. That is going to be November 14th. Um, that is going to be in Houston with the, sorry, Interfaith Environmental Network of Houston. We've done done um we've done one in the past with them and we have done um uh, community cleanups with them as well so i'm going to go ahead and grab you this do 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 where is my there we go i'm going to grab you the link for this to check it out um if you would like to register it is on our event page um but yes it is november 14th it's a sunday um we're going to have pickup from 1 to 3 p.m and then uh, do the Zoom um, workshop, which is basically us going over the installation video, which is about 11 minutes long, having time for Q&A for people to go, wait, what, how do I do that where? Um, and then they do get a follow, follow up. I provide the video link for them to watch anytime they want, as well as a one pager of tips, tricks, and kind of a breakdown of the different specifics that I went over. So I went ahead and put the link in the chat for where you can um, register if you're interested. It is only $35 for a barrel and kit, which if you were to buy the same barrel and installation kit, it would probably run you about 130 bucks. So definitely saving money and saving plastic because our barrels are recycled from Coca-Cola. 
Um, they're one of our sponsors along with Lionel Bissell for this program. Um, so they donate their old syrup barrels to us. So it's all like food safe, food grade plastic, um, but it's not new plastic. So that's another bonus is that our barrels are repurposing plastic instead of having to recycle or put them back um, into the environment. So Very thanks cool. for the question. Uh, Mel, uh, you've got the next question. Yes, I was asking, wondering, am I on? I can't. Uh, yeah, we can yes. hear you. Okay. Do you do anything with the balloon releases, how, how it affects the environment? Yes. Um, so we actually were one of the organizations that um, pushed for the intentional balloon release ban, which just got passed in Galveston. So in, yeah. in this past February, it is um, since then, it is now illegal to intentionally release any balloon into the environment. So basically they can be fined, I believe it's $500 for releasing a balloon into the environment. So if they can identify where it came from, if they can catch somebody in the act, if they see that somebody is posting about doing an intentional balloon release, they can address it and say, you know, that's, that's not legal here. Um, and as much as it's, it can be a sensitive subject because a lot of people do that for memorials and things like that. Turtle Island Restoration Network, um, has uh, alternatives to balloon releases on their website that suggests other things and ways to honor, um, you know, lost ones. Um, because we we don't want to just say no, don't do that, because it's a sensitive subject, obviously for a lot of people. But there are better ways to honor that person without harming the environment. Because if that person knew, they probably wouldn't want that to happen, right? If they knew that these balloons could come down and injure wildlife. So yes, we, we have helped with that and we're bringing up the watershed so that hopefully in Houston and all of the cities in between, there will be an intentional balloon release ban. So that's our kind of foot in the door in order to have reduced balloon usage. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and now we have Mike Pettit. He's got yeah. a couple of questions. Yeah. I, think. Uh, I was gonna say, do major grocers such as HEB and Kroger in new local retailers right down the street for you, that is Amazon, which coming in, which is coming into League City, uh, are these organizations receptive to the idea of reduction of single-use plastics and packaging in general? And is there a place for a dialogue with them? Yes, um, yes. There, you know, when it comes to franchises and stores like Kroger, HEB, things like that pretty much anything they're gonna do in store has to go through corporate first. So anytime we go in and ask them to even post a flyer about an event we have, they have to get it approved through corporate. So, you know, there's a lot of red tape, but I do know that Kroger has a mission, I believe by 2023 to eliminate single use bags in their stores. So there are pilot programs for for bag, um, for not having plastic bags in some of their Kroger stores already, um, but not here yet, which is really unfortunate because I live on the island and I see right across the seawall, I mean, I see these plastic bags just like floating off across the street right into the beach. Um, so there's definitely room for dialogue. Um, Surfrider, I know, has done a lot with Kroger. They allowed them to put up their signage in the parking lot here, for example, that says, don't forget to bring your bag. Um, there's definitely room for it, local restaurants and businesses. And I know that the Galveston, um, the Galveston Park Board actually is, is launching a three-pronged approach um, here on the island. And that includes um, working with businesses to kind of have um, these different levels of sustainability that they can brag about. And so kind of setting up setting up how they can show off how sustainable they are and ways that they can be more sustainable. Um, so there's definitely room for dialogue. Uh, today, we were just talking about when Amazon shows up, what we can do um, with their staff to try to get them to understand and see the problem firsthand along the bay um, and maybe make some changes. I do know that uh, anytime I go into Target, there's more and more sustainable products on their shelves. And they do have recycling for plastic bags, for batteries, for things like that in their stores. Um, and the more I go there, the more I see these uh, plastic-free products. So next time you're in a store, check out the options they have for single-use plastic, free, you know, health and beauty products, shampoos, cleaners, things like that. It's pretty cool. We're seeing it more and more. <laughs> Well, Sasha, we want to thank you so much for taking your time to give us this excellent and wonderful presentation. Uh, it's been very informative. Um, let's see, Mike, I'm going to pass it back to you. 
Well, I, I would just like to thank Sasha also for an excellent presentation on the Galveston to Bay report card. And probably thank you even more so for actually providing measurements of what's going on in the environment that we live in. It's the, and, and until we measure it, it's hard to know what to fix. Yeah, uh, exactly. Terrific presentation. Thank you. And it is, you know, that is really important note is like I said, it helps us identify trends and it helps us identify what priorities we need to be focused on, you know, like freshwater wetlands, for example, you know, that, that grade has been low. And so projects that we can help out with, with providing more freshwater wetlands is a great, great, great priority to have and continuing to plant the saltwater wetland grasses has shown us to keep that grade more steady. So we can kind of see both how our efforts are helping either maintain or improve, and also where we should focus next. So we, we can see that pollution is a problem. We can see that these things are issues. We can see freshwater wetlands need help, and we can make sure that, that those things are, are addressed and that attention's brought to them, to the community.